This is the first part of our three-part study of film history, and this first week we are going to be studying silent film and also the period at the very beginning of movie history called early cinema. This first period of American film history lasts from about the mid-1890s until basically the end of the 1920s. This period uh, of early American film history in which the movies did not have a soundtrack. They were silent movies. And uh, in our film history unit, we are just going to be looking at American film history. Uh, we don't have the scope or the, or the time to pay attention to world cinema, although there certainly is a great um, and rich history of cinema around the world in terms of how it developed, but we are going to be focusing strictly on American cinema and uh, Hollywood movies for the most part. This period uh, of about 30 years between the 1890s and the 1920s is the period in which film or the movies were established as an art form, as a business, uh, as a form of entertainment, as, and as a form of public amusement, uh, as a business in which, you know, companies tried to make a profit by producing movies and releasing them for audiences to see, as a form of entertainment in which audiences went to theaters to see movies, uh, which is, of course, a form of public amusement as well. There's a, a long history of public amusement that the movies fits into as one form of public amusement and entertainment. Uh, and there was uh, different forms of entertainment and different forms of public amusement that already existed and pre-existed the movies in the 1890s and, and within which the movies fit into when they first emerged as a form of entertainment. And we're going to be learning a little bit about that this week. Throughout this first period, the silent cinema period of film history, we also uh, are going to be learning about how film style and film narrative evolved throughout this first 30 years or so of film history. Uh, there's a lot of very interesting developments that you'll see in the range of films that we're going to be watching in terms of uh, going from films that really had no narrative content at all uh, to full feature films by the beginning of the 1920s, not that dissimilar from what we have today uh, in terms of length and in terms of the complexity of the stories that were told, and also in terms of film style. All of the elements that we have been studying so far in this class uh, in terms of editing and mise-en-scene and cinematography all developed greatly over the course of the silent cinema era. And then, of course, uh, is at the end of the silent cinema era uh, that sound was finally added as a new stylistic element to movies. So we have uh, looked at the characteristics of silent cinema a little bit already, and of course the main thing that distinguishes silent movies is that there is no recorded soundtrack that is on the film. Uh, the film uh, itself has no synchronized soundtrack with dialogue and sound effects and music, uh, those three analytical categories of sound that we learned about. But... Uh, silent cinema or audiences watching silent movies did have some sound that they listened to while they were watching silent movies. And that took the form of sound elements, mainly, uh, almost uh, always entirely music, that were performed live in the movie theater uh, as audiences watched the movie. Uh, so there were Depending on the size of the movie theater, there would be, uh, in the biggest movie theaters, a full orchestra that played a soundtrack of music along with the movie. Uh, in small, uh, slightly smaller theaters, there would be a pipe organ that could replicate the sounds of a variety of different kinds of instruments. Uh, 
that gave musical accompaniment to the movie. And then in smaller movie theaters, uh, just a piano would play. And there would be, there was uh, in the silent era, a whole uh, industry or a whole category of employees or performers for movie theaters that played live musical scores to the movies that were shown in the theaters. Silent movies were, by and large, black and white in nature. Color cinematography had not really been developed yet. Uh, that did not happen until about the mid-1930s. But there were, from the very beginnings of cinema in the 1890s, experiments with color. Uh, adding color elements either by painting color onto the individual frames uh, or uh, basically dyeing the entire strip of film so that there was a tone of color. Uh, and we'll see some examples of that in the film clips that we're going to watch this week, especially in The Great Train Robbery, which has a few elements of color painted onto the individual frames. Uh, but by and large, uh, apart from these few experiments that took place, silent movies were black and white in nature. Silent movie acting was quite a bit different from what we're used to as well, uh, based on pantomime, as we learned about uh, in week two when we watched the clip from the Charlie Chaplin movie. Uh, this, of course, was due to the fact that actors in silent movies did not uh, have the ability to portray or, uh, or convey emotion and other things through their voices. They had to rely just on their bodies and on their facial expressions uh, to, to create their performances. And as a result of that, the performances are a little bit more stylized or a little bit more exaggerated or a little bit more... Um, pronounced than we are used to seeing in the more realistic sorts of acting that have been the norm in the last uh, several decades. At the beginning of silent cinema, uh, most of what happened in terms of what was filmed in the films was modeled after vaudeville, and also what um, the way in which movies were shown in theaters and the context in which movies were shown in theaters was modeled after a form of stage entertainment from the late 1800s called vaudeville. During this first uh, period, uh, about the first half of the silent movie era, movies uh, were a little different than the narrative cinema that later emerged. Uh, movies, the, the nature of movies, was what film scholars have labeled the cinema of attractions. And I will talk a little bit more about exactly what that means uh, a little bit later in this lecture. But for the first f uh, 10 or 15 years of uh, the movies in the 1890s, up till about 1905, movies followed a model that was that is now called the cinema of attractions. And by the beginning of the 19-teens, this had shifted, for the most part, to narrative cinema or movies that told stories. Movies had their roots in vaudeville in both in terms of what was represented or filmed in movies, as well as the uh, theatrical or exhibition environment in which movies were shown, or the theaters in which movies were shown. Vaudeville was a form of stage entertainment in the late 1800s, uh, starting in the years immediately after the Civil War in the late 1860s and 1870s. And it was a uh, a little different than traditional stage plays where there's a you know hour and a half two hour uh, play that's a, a complete narrative or a self-contained narrative vaudeville in contrast was about the same length as a full-length stage play uh, a vaudeville show was around an hour and a half to two hours in length but rather than consisting of one story that was told all the way through it was consisting of many different short acts in a program 
so there were many short, in a, in a, say, a two-hour time block, there would be maybe 10 or 12 short acts that would appear, each one of those acts being uh, about 10 to 15 minutes in length. And the variety, there was a great variety of different kinds of acts that appeared in vaudeville shows. There might be animal acts, uh, different kinds of animals that did tricks or uh, that sort of thing. There might be individual scenes from different plays. Uh, popular plays that audiences were familiar with might have one scene drawn out of them or taken out of them and reenacted as one act in a vaudeville show of uh, 10 or 15 minutes in length. There were comics or comedians, uh, not completely different from what we have today in terms of stand-up comics, you know, a comedian that would uh, do an act of uh, 10 minutes or so in length where they told jokes. There would be uh, different kinds of uh, acrobats and strong men who uh, did their D uh, displayed their talents or their skills in terms of acrobatic stunts, uh, or strong men who, who lifted weights and other sorts of things. There were singers who sang songs. You know, a, a, a singer would maybe come on for a 10 minute act and, and sing two or three or four songs. And then there were various sorts of trick artists, sort of like uh, you might see or hear about from the circus today, you know, things like. Uh, sword swallowers and uh, and that sort of thing. At the beginning of the of cinema history in the eighteen nineties, uh, early films featured these kinds of acts. Uh, so an early film of a, a minute or two in length might be uh, a strong man, or it might be an acrobat, or it might be uh, a scene from a play, even though. Uh, there wasn't any dialogue, uh, audiences would enjoy for a minute or two just watching the reenactment of the scene from the play. So early films featured these sorts of acts uh, as their content in many respects. Vaudeville theaters were also the first place where movies were shown to audiences. Uh, it ended up working very well both for the vaudeville theaters, as well as for uh, the filmmakers making the films, for a program of uh, 10 or 15 minutes worth of short films to appear as one act in a vaudeville show. Uh, so within vaudeville shows in which you had live performers, uh, such as comics and acrobats, acrobats and singers and, and actors and animal acts, uh, there would be one act in which the recorded moving images of films were shown. Uh, and so films formed uh, a vaudeville turn. Each act in a vaudeville show uh, was sometimes called a vaudeville turn. And for the first several years of movie history in the 1890s and the early 1900s, uh, most of the contexts in which movies were shown were as one short 10-minute uh, or so act of short films within the context of a larger vaudeville show. The content and the approach that filmmakers took to making movies in this first 10 or 15 years of the movie uh, history was what has since been come to called come to be called the cinema of attractions. Uh, this is a this is a label that film scholars have given to this period in recent years. This is not what they were called or what the approach was called at the time of uh, when silent movies were made. Um, but this is the way that this period of film history is typically looked at today. The cinema of attractions is the idea that Moving pictures, moving images, were interesting just as a curiosity or as a novelty in and of themselves. Because at this time, uh, in the 1890s, prior to this, nobody had ever seen moving images before. Still photography had existed for approximately 50 years, a little more than 50 years, by the 1890s, and so by that time, people were familiar with still images, and uh, slide shows called magic lantern shows uh, 
were uh, very familiar to audiences in general and, and also formed parts of vaudeville shows uh, or standalone shows showing different sorts of slides using photography and painted slides. But moving images uh, were very novel and uh, very of great interest as a, as a new sort of technology in the 1890s. And so just the fact that there existed moving images was something that was uh, of interest to audiences. And one of the things that filmmakers did was they used the existence of moving images to uh, use as a means of seeing well-known acts or types of acts of different performers or genres of entertainers. Uh, that since movies appeared in vaudeville shows for the most part, the content of early movies were the same sorts of acts that audiences were already seeing in vaudeville shows. Uh, and so a particular vaudeville performer or a particular type of vaudeville performer could be filmed and be seen much widely uh, than that particular performer was able to do just by traveling around and performing in person. The term attractions in this idea of the cinema of attractions uh, refers to the same sort of thing as uh, carnival attractions. Movies were attractions in the same sense as carnival attractions. A little bit of a sideshow, a novelty, something to watch for a few minutes, but not something that uh, anybody was going to give any sort of sustained attention to. Uh, so watching movies just for the sake of watching images that moved and watching some of these sorts of acts that people were familiar with, um, but not really paying a whole lot of attention to um, or extended attention to watching moving images. It was only a little bit later that movies began, really began to uh, tell stories and narrative films began to emerge by about 1902 or so. Uh, some movies that began to tell stories began to emerge. Some of the earliest films, uh, or most of the earliest films, are very short. They're, they're less than a minute uh, or so in length. And the two programs of films that you're going to take a look at in the film excerpts for this week include films by the Thomas Edison Company in the United States and by the Lumiere Brothers in France. Now, both of these groups of filmmakers were some of the leading uh, pioneers in just figuring out how to make movies, you know, what what is a movie or what was a movie. Um, both of these groups developed their own movie cameras and projectors and their own approaches to uh, what sorts of material to film. The Edison films were more vaudeville-oriented uh, in terms of filming the sorts of vaudeville acts that I've been talking about, the Lumiere films were a different kind of film in that they were able to go out because their camera was a lot less uh, bulky and was more portable. They were able to sort of go out into the world and film everyday activities. Um, you know, sort of like a documentary filmmaker, go out into the world and just film whatever they saw. So these are the two groups of films uh, that you're going to be watching first for the film excerpts. And right now you should pause this, uh, this audio lecture and go and read what it says in the lecture material page uh, about the Edison and Lumiere films and watch those two groups of films and then return to... Uh, continue the audio lecture after you have watched uh, those two groups of films from Edison and from the Lumiere brothers. By about the middle of the first decade of the 20th century, uh, by 1905 or so, storytelling in film or using films to tell stories was beginning to become the norm. You know, the novelty had worn off, 
uh, in terms of the, the cinema of attractions. Audiences were no longer all that interested in watching moving images just for the sake of watching moving images. And so one of the things that filmmakers did, or the, the main thing that filmmakers did, was they began to use um, uh, use filmmaking or using film to, to tell stories, uh, to, to tell narratives. By this time, films had gradually begun to get longer, uh, the technical capacity or the technical capabilities of movies had increased to the point where uh, many movies were several minutes in length, as long as 10 or 12 minutes in length. And so the films were longer, and of course having a longer uh, running time is uh, one of the things that makes it a little bit easier to tell a story Filmmakers began to develop different elements of film style by this time as well. They began to use uh, brief single-shot scenes, sometimes called tableaus. Uh, they were also uh, begun to use different sorts of camera tricks, uh, taking advantage of the technical capabilities of movie making rather than just recording things, using things like stop motion, using things like... Uh, turning off the camera and, and uh, creating different sorts of what seemed like magic tricks uh, using the, the movie camera. So filmmakers began to make films that told uh, real simple stories using uh, or developing different sorts of genre elements that would become common later on. And there's two of these short films, each of them approximately 10 minutes in length that make up the remainder of the film excerpts for this week's lecture material. The first of these is a, a film called A Trip to the Moon. It is another French film by a director named Georges Méliès, and this is a film that uses this uh, tableau sort of technique, and you will see when you watch the film exactly what that means. The camera just set up uh, in a stationary sort of uh, medium long shot or long shot, uh, a, a backdrop in terms of a set existing there in terms of the mise en scène, and then all of the uh, all of the action just unfolding in that uh, medium long shot and taking place, and then a cut to a new shot with the entire scene unfolding in that tableau. The Great Train Robbery which is from about the same time. It's directed by Edwin S. Porter, a filmmaker working for Edison at this time. And this one is a little bit more dynamic in terms of its use of the camera. It has some exterior shooting and uh, a little bit more dynamic in terms of the story that's told as well. And Porter was one of the filmmakers at this period that was really beginning to develop the capabilities of the movie camera in terms of different uh, subject camera distances, uh, different things related to editing, and so forth. So you should stop the audio lecture again at this point and go and watch uh, A Trip to the Moon and The Great Train Robbery uh, and reading the material that's there uh, in a, uh, introducing those two films as well. And when you have finished watching those two films, return and listen to the last portion of this audio lecture. In the mid 1900s, around uh, 1905 or so, uh, you know, about the time or just after the time of A Trip to the Moon and The Great Train Robbery, movies began to move out of uh, vaudeville theaters and start to be shown in the first uh, strictly movies uh, theaters, theaters that showed nothing but movies, and these were given the name Nickelodeons. Uh, Odeon was uh, is the Greek name uh, for theater, and there were many types of live and vaudeville theaters uh, with the name Odeon. And then Nickel uh, was the price that it cost for a movie admission at this time. And so the word Nickelodeon was coined, and that was uh, the name given to the first movie theaters. <laughs> 
These were very small in comparison to vaudeville theaters. Vaudeville theaters typically seated 1,000 to 2,000 people, but Nickelodeons were very small seating, sometimes only 100 or so people, 100 or 200 people. And they were usually opened in just small vacant storefronts. Uh, a, a vacant storefront would be available and a movie exhibitor would rent that storefront and equip it with seats and a small screen and a projector and turn it into a movie theater and begin to show movies to audiences. By about 1906, uh, Nickelodeons had become the main type of movie theater that audiences um, attended movies at. This was uh, a form of movie theater that began to show only movies. Uh, this is where that practice began. And a Nickelodeon program was about an hour's worth of short films, some of the films now being a little bit longer than uh, the Edison and Lumiere movies, uh, you know, more in the length of the Trip to the Moon and Great Train Robbery. So within an hour's worth of uh, a Nickelodeon program, uh, audience members might see uh, six, six to eight short films of different kinds, some of them narrative, some of them still documentary in nature, uh, some of them, you know, even still uh, in this period, somewhat related to the sorts of things that appeared in films during the Cinema of Attractions era. By the mid-19-teens, uh, and by the end of that decade, in the late 19-teens, movie theaters that were more like the previous vaudeville theaters that movies had been shown in began to appear. And these were called movie palaces, or sometimes picture palaces, because they're very lavish, very large, seating 1,000, 2,000. Uh, by the end of the 1920s, the biggest seating as many as 5,000 people, uh, and were very ornate, uh, having uh, very elaborate d decor and decorations on the interiors as well as the exteriors of these theaters. And so by the end of the 19-teens, uh, this had become the main type of movie theater, and depending, of course, on the, on the size of the city, uh, movie palaces were bigger and, and or smaller than in other areas. But by the end of the 19-teens, this had become the main type of movie theater that audiences watched movies in. And also by uh, the mid to late 19-teens, uh, partially as a result of the rise of the movie palace as the main form of movie theater, uh, the feature film, feature-length movies of the same length that we're used to today had become the norm. Uh, um, the movie, a feature film, had become the entire entertainment program by uh, about the 19, uh, late 19-teens, by about 1920, with short subjects still shown beforehand, cartoons, newsreels, uh, and other sorts of short films shown in advance of the feature film. This had become the norm by about 1920, and the remaining 10 years or so of the silent movie era uh, during the decade of the 1920s consisted of uh, a feature film with a few short subjects being shown before it in large movie palace-type movie theaters. <laughs> 